Hey everybody, it's John Reed. It's Friday. How we doing? My uh, surprise special guest, Barb Musher Zinc, is not here yet. So what's going to happen? Maybe you'll join me. We'll see. Um, I'm going to give Barb a few minutes because I know she was on the road today. So um, this is an extension of our work workshopping Gen AI enterprise creativity conversation from last week, parsing the BS. And uh, man, this is a massive topic, and I think it's an important one. So uh, I don't think we solved it last time, but Barb wrote some really interesting stuff that actually came live like right before the show on Diginomica, and I missed it. So I was like, Barb, can you come on this week so we can talk a little bit about some of the points? These are my slides from last time. Um, anyhow, let me just see where we are here. Cool. So if you have comments on this topic, as I go through some of this, just let me know. Um, and maybe I'll bring you on to the site. You can join me. So if you have your cam on, you might get lured in. Uh, before I get started, I just want to say that I uh, posted a uh, post today that I spent a lot of time on. It's a intellectual tribute of sorts to Neil Radden, who passed away earlier this spring about a month ago, and he did some fantastic content for us in the area of AI ethics. So today I wrote about, about Neil's work and how it inspired me and why it still matters. And I uh, hope you'll check that one out, because that is kind of a go-to for sort of the ideas that he had around ethics, ethics washing, and why we acquire ethical debt just like we acquire technical debt. Pretty important concepts, I think. And they do tie into these issues, I think, on creativity as well. So give me a shout if you show up on the show today. And let me just tell you just a little bit about how this came about and why I wanted to get into sort of the, the next iteration of this topic. What, what triggered this event? Well, mostly originally it was Gen AI content creation, PR bullshit overdose. And I was really struggling with the fact that I've been all year long on projects, project summaries, shows, talking to customers, and just getting a sense of like what they're using Gen AI for and what they're not. And I really found that the creativity part of the use case was pretty much a modest part but it's still really important to talk about because obviously you know when you step back from the enterprise into the cultural space and the artistic space this is a very very potent conversation and it goes back to how these models were originally trained and all of that so that's what inspired this and so workshopping i think is a really interesting video concept which is kind of kicking around ideas and seeing if you can get from something kind of like just a rant, I guess, to something a little more formal. And then I was going to eventually challenge myself to write a little bit of a method around this that, that people can think about for their projects in terms of how to think about creativity from a generative AI perspective. I think a couple of things that come to mind immediately are, are just know what you're getting into as far as the ROI of what you might consider creativity. And a lot of what we consider creativity in the enterprise, I would call content generation, which is not to say it's a bad thing. It's just different. And the one of the big differences between content generation and creativity is that content creativity, I think, has a, a high tolerance level for the eccentricities of large language models. Because when you're creating and when you're using Gen AI to create content, as long as you know you don't have factual problems, if it's like some kind of factual thing, yeah, if you can get it to create taglines for you and stuff like that that you can use or consider, well, that, I think that's a that that is sort of a creative ideation exercise, and it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. Whereas if you if you use Gen AI to create job descriptions and reduce the workload of your HR beleaguered HR representatives, well. That's not creation. That's content generation. And the tolerance for mistakes and creative flourishes is going to be a lot lower. Just if you're joining me now, 
I'm still hoping I'm going to bring Barb on in a sec to talk a little bit about her piece. So uh, we're going to hang out for her for a little bit. And then if you want to join up and say a few things, feel free. I might bring you on camera if I can lure you in. And uh, if I can't get Barb on in a bit, then we'll re we'll rebook it because shit happens. Um, but I do want to share with you a couple of a couple of things that came up since the last discussion. The last time we did this, we also got into a bit of a jobs debate, and I think that's really a separate conversation in some ways because jobs is like a really high stakes, nuanced conversation for generative AI in general. So if I do that, I want to really give it the full treatment. Um, having said that, I do have like a little bit more on that topic as well. So let's just have a look here at some of the issues that I got into last time because I want to show you something that happened on LinkedIn. So this is like typical stuff, right? Like every website is going to offer you a chance to like create create uh, your post with generative AI or whatever. Um, and I think, you know, hey, if if you're in a real hurry and you're short on ideas, like, go for it. But I just want to show you this. Oh, hi, Brent. Brent says, I'm one of the recent PPN shows. A guest was asked what the most overrated part of Gen AI discussion. And they replied the whole creativity over emphasis. Yeah, for sure. And... <clears throat> Look, I mean, there, there's a whole thing around creativity for artists and, and the role of AI. And artists have, the, the problem is that artists are on their back foot with this technology because it's been exploited by big tech at the expense of, of their creatives work. But the history of art is actually use technology um, in, in a potent way to, to enhance your creativity. I mean, I, I would point you to Jimi Hendrix and the Star Spangled Banner for one. Um, that, that's electric guitar mischief that wasn't possible in the in the 18th century. So artists have figured out how to harness technology in all kinds of interesting ways. And I think they will with AI as well. They're just on the back foot right now because of how this technology has been uh, developed and rolled out. In the enterprise context, though, Bren, as we discussed here, the, the role of creativity is actually, I think, one of the least compelling aspects of, of AI. And, and the irony, too, is that a lot of times like to get good stuff out of a prompt, for example, you actually need more human creativity, not less using these systems. And a lot of the most interesting use cases that I've seen for generative AI this spring do not involve the creative aspect whatsoever. And hey, Brent, if you want to um, pop on in a few, let me know, chat for a few. If you want to shoot the shit, you may be like in your bunny slippers because i know you're off the road now so you might not feel like hopping on cam but i, I think my guest may be having connectivity problems so let me know if you want to pop on for a few um anyway i just have this slide here that i wanted to show y'all because i think this is interesting one of the things i was i was kind of railing about was was sort of this notion of enterprise creativity with generative ai and like being really really careful about the jargon laden aspect of this because I don't know about you, but most customers I know they want to communicate in plain terms, not jargon terms. So I just wanted to show you this slide here. So, um, yeah, and Brent says maybe it's the tra traditional view of creativity that the business world has. It's a real issue. I think that's part of it, Brent. I think also I think there's a lot of people that that kind of like the idea of instant creativity, like, um, and. In fact, like I think like becoming a creative person is actually arduous and challenging. But I do think we all have it in us to to be creative, not necessarily all to be artists in a specific sense. I actually read a book on that, but that's a whole different topic. But but I think a lot of times there's this feeling of like, well, this technology is gonna give us instant creativity and I can move on with my day. And that's not how creative creativity works. I mean like, I mean, when you look at like your work, for example, in the video context and how you've had to put so much creativity into thinking about how to bring the right gear, how to bring the right portable gear, how to set up shoots. How, but most importantly, as we discuss how to get people talking about the right things, yeah, that's just not going to come out of the box, right? Um, okay, so you can join for a few. All right, so let me just uh, go through a couple of these things and Brent, I'll pop you a link here in a minute. We'll 
you can join me because I'm going to give Barb a minute or two more, but I think Barb's missed her boat here. So just have a look at this for a sec. Um, my latest Digonomic Emissive, and this is like a this is like an overview of of this um, article I did on the construction industry and the impact of sort of talent shortages versus like more modern software. And the interview subject was uh, Dustin Stevens. This is up on Digonomica now. But anyway, so the top one is the one that I wrote. It says, um, my latest Digonomica missive. Stevens has seen plenty of shifts over his decades in the business, but the changes construction and real estate companies now face is a post-pandemic litany of issues. How are customers responding? Time to dig in. So I wrote that in like very informal language to try to just draw people in a little bit. Uh, you know, I probably could have made it even more like jugular, but anyway, that's what I wrote. And then I asked LinkedIn, so LinkedIn wanted to like do the AI thing or whatever. So get a load of what LinkedIn did here. My latest Digonomic emissive explores the evolving landscape of construction and real estate companies post pandemic. Stevens, with decades of experience in the industry, sheds light on the myriad of challenges these sectors are currently navigating. How are customers adapting to these changes? Time to delve deeper. And then they threw out some some hashtags, which I can't stand. And like, how many people click on hashtags on LinkedIn? Come on. I Have you ever clicked on a hashtag on LinkedIn? Seriously. Um, so, so I think it's just an interesting contrast. And I think this is like a good example of why I think you have to be really careful with using, quote unquote, creative generative AI for creative purposes. And the shame of it is that AI can really help content teams scale and personalize their content. But I don't think the idea here is to like stand aside and say, oh, you know, this this can do a better job than me. And I think you really run the risk. Just be careful because I think you run the risk of really creating some very jargon laden prose that is very stiff. And okay, maybe a lot of people in the enterprise get away with writing like that. But I think that's just crap. And and look, I'm not sitting here saying that like, that what I wrote is like some kind of like going to be nominated for some kind of poetry award. But the thing is it was in my voice and it made sense. And I've worked kind of hard actually to communicate in kind of a real way. Um, So anyway, I just, I, that's just a little bit of a caution uh, for, for, for folks as they think about the use of these tools. Now, you know, when I think, you know, and I've, I've kind of covered this in the past one. And by the way, Brent, you're, um, I'm going to hold your comment because your, uh, your backstage link has been sent. So just go ahead and grab that. Brent Leary is going to join me for a few minutes to kick this around. So, so what I was writing about, first of all, is that there's a lot of powerful tools around creativity that Gen AI is really, really good at, including translating things into multiple languages, into different formats, going from audio to video, going from white paper to podcast. Uh, I I think pretty soon it's going to be able to go from white paper to slide deck really effectively. So in in some sense, part of what this does is it helps you to scale stuff. And then, and then of course there's, there's an element of personalization around the distribution of the content as well. So to me, that's really exciting, but I'm just telling enterprise marketing teams right now, don't put out a bunch of bland crap content, okay? Like, it's not going to work. It's not interesting. Now, one thing I think you can do is you can use it, uh, you know, if you modify your generative AI architecture, as a lot of vendors have done in the marketing space to create content that is specific to a particular framework. So example would be like creating FAQ documentation for support people and on the website. Yeah, that could work fine because at that case, it's it's really not about the caliber of the writing at all. It's really just about, you know, making sure that the that it's got data specific material to your issues and your products. And so that would be a focal point, I think, for a pretty good use case. Um, Brent, here we go. Brent Leary is in the house. Yeah, in my house, which is really great. <laughs> Good, man. You, you were hitting it hard there for a little bit, as were we all, but you were definitely feeling it towards the end, I'm sure. 
Yeah, well, I know you were too. So, <laughs> damn, I'm still trying to figure out what happened and, and did I actually learn anything? Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I actually think I did though. So maybe that that's the the, oh, the benefit cool. to all this stuff. I don't know, but uh, right, let, me, wanna, let me get out of the way though. Uh, congratulations, you know, all the Celtics and all that stuff. Oh yeah, I wouldn't lord that over you, man. Uh, <laughs> I it it feels good, but let me just say that that um the rest of the Boston teams are going to suck for a long time. So I got to like roll with the Celts because that's all we got, man. We don't, we don't have anything else. So I'm okay with, but, that. uh, but, uh, but there's going to be a lot of pain and suffering, uh, as a Boston sports fan, but that's not the focus of our talk today. So thank you, Brent, by the way, Brent, did you notice like, this is actually pretty cool with, um, uh, Streamyard is I think pretty crap for screen sharing, but it's gotten really good for slides. Like, like, like so for the slide layout like i can just like pop it there i can pop you know i can do all this different shit and i don't i think you just pop yourself off the screen there man all right so this is a first uh usually yeah, and, okay, there and, he is. <laughs> and i can also like get rid of the whole show <laughs> which is like really awesome um <laughs> So I, I don't recommend doing that part, but I just, I just think that's pretty cool. Cause like you can like basically like move around a lot, but you don't have to remove it. So anyway, that's kind of useful. So they're, anyway, they're getting, uh, they're putting updates in, making it a little better incrementally. I guess. And you just went away again. What's going on here, man. <laughs> I don't know what the, should I just uh, start talking? Like I'm the host. Uh, Brent, you're taking over now, man. <laughs> uh, I don't know what happened there, but anyway, I we're, we're pressing on with with Brent Leary here. Brent, I'm glad to have you on the show. Yeah, glad, always glad to be here, man. So, so tell me about real artists in your last comment there about real artists and how they integrate new technology. Share share your thought on that. Well, you know, artists were artists before there was technology. They would at least, you know, had art kind of ingrained in them and they would try to find ways to get it out. And I think uh, there's a difference between that kind of approach so that when you, something, some new piece of technology comes along, uh, artists who's been used to creating want to try to figure out what can you do? What can I create with this? And, and they enhance their creation process. Whereas people who weren't artists but kind of want to have the end result of the artist they d depend heavily on the technology to to get them through um and i think that's what we're seeing more because let's not everybody has it within themselves to be a real artist but as this technology gets better people who don't have it in them don't need to have it in them quote unquote because they can kind of lean on the better cheaper more affordable easier to use technology to have outputs like an artist but as you were saying the more people who have access to these things it just creates a whole bunch of stuff that isn't really you know true to what the art is all about to begin with so i i feel like you're you're, you're on to something that's why um i've had a lot of these conversations around it, you know the the gen ai stuff is great but it's great in the hands of people who really don't see it as something to just take over what they were all they were doing previously, but to enhance and to experiment on things that they may have never been able to do. Now they're able to take what they know and use these new tools to do something different, not just to, all right, well, I never wanted to do this in the first place, but now I can just click a button and bam, I got this. Right. So. I think those are great points. And there's a few different personas that are kind of interesting. And mostly I want to talk enterprise about this, but like just stepping back for a sec, if you're like a talented creative artist, like I said, artists are always experimenting with new technologies. And I think many artists are going to experiment with these tools in, in the context of their work and it will be useful to them in various ways. The, the reason artists are mostly angry about these tools right now is that these tools have displaced a lot of their copyrighted work and they haven't been compensated, so they're pissed, and I totally get that. But, but then, you, like you said, you have people who are perhaps struggle to create in certain ways, or they struggle with a certain medium, 
like like um they have issues with writing for whatever reason but they're good at other things but they now they can like maybe write where they couldn't before but still to earn your stripes in an attention economy you have to have something going for you and it it not many of us are going to be celebrities and top notch influencers so as more and more people have the ability to create who's going to consume it and so that's why there's still work to be done on your unique point of view. So you, the tools may make the actual creativity faster if you get what I'm saying, but your unique point of view that you bring to anything you do still has to be developed. And and in an enterprise context, it gets reframed a little bit, not just a unique individual point of view, but unique corporate data. So so the tool, the creative tools can be interesting when in an enterprise context when you're using your own data. But what I was trying to caution against is this idea that you can just, oh my God, like I'm going to publish this awesome blog post using this tool. And I'm just telling you, no, like it, that's not going to work. You know, I think some of the uh, best examples of creativity, particularly in the enterprise, are overlooked because they have nothing to do with the imagery that uh, most people get stuck on. Uh, I mean, I, I've been, I think, the last five or six weeks, I don't know, seven or eight events. And the things that caught my attention were how some of these vendors were applying Gen AI to like meat and potato use cases, uh, you know, helping yep. with, you know, helping people actually get stuff done uh, and in a manner that yep. is much more uh, efficient and effective and collaborative. It's not like uh, draw me an orange uh, gorilla or create a poem with 500 words on this subject. I mean, that's the stuff that seems to get all the headlines. But the creativity that I'm seeing has absolutely nothing to do with that. It's it's you people who are actually you applying these technologies. And it's not just Gen AI, it's all the different varieties of AI to right. actually solve challenges that are way more important than being able to create weird images uh, by just using a prompt. Yeah, for sure. And that was a little bit what I really liked um, when when um, Barb got into this a little bit in, in her piece, because to your point, she was looking at marketing in particular, but she was saying like, like that the marketing part, like the creativity part is just a small part of what a marketer can potentially do with these tools. And I think she was expressing a little bit of a frustration that that we're not having that conversation yet. So like so for example in her piece she she said I think very similar to to what you described she said like I look at the sales teams the tools they're getting that include generative AI she named some tools and she said these tools give people deep insights into customers that analyze account data and provide summaries and insights on meetings she said, yes, it also helps to create content, but for me, it's the ability to find those insights so much faster through prompts that's most important. And she goes on to talk more about all the possibilities inside of marketing that, that AI-related tools could potentially help, um, and that content creation is just a small, small part of that. And so, so that was part of what I was like doing in these in these sessions, including last week, Brent, was just kind of go off on that a little bit because I just kind of got my fill of it this spring. And I was just like, would you put down your slides showing off creativity as this core thing? <laughs> and like, like, and and let's talk about these other things because when you start getting into it, like in some of your videos, I think you documented some of these things. And it's like, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Like, why don't we do that? <laughs> you know? Like, well, it's it's almost sort of like the creativity thing is the lowest common denominator <laughs> across the board. Anybody right. can talk about it. Anybody could kind of feature a, a picture or an image. And and let's face it, the vast majority of folks using these uh, these genetic you know, tools, that's all they're going to stay at. They're 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 going to stay at a certain right. low level because it's quick, it's easy, it doesn't cost them a lot of money, it doesn't cost them a lot of time or effort. It's the folks who go beyond that lowest common denominator. To look at applying Gen AI to real uh, challenges, to real problems. And they're the ones that are going to find the, the most creative and important kind of ways to illustrate the importance of what Gen AI can do. It's just 
we're just so overwhelmed and deluged by the 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 low hanging fruit when it comes to this stuff. And it is frustrating. It's frustrating to me because, you know, we, you and I, we, and folks like us, we go to a lot of things, you know, we hear it all the time that, you know, some, you know, the vendors have their individual conferences. They think this is like, you know, nobody's ever talking about this. And we're like, are you kidding me? I've been to like three events in the last week and you all are talking about it, but it's the ones that are actually getting beyond that. It's, are the ones that are really interesting. And and and, it, and they are a lot of them out there. It's just that what they're doing isn't as catchy, I guess. Maybe it doesn't catch the eye or the attention as easily as the, the things that we've been talking about like for the last year and a half. Yeah, right. Like there's not a lot of like sex appeal to some of the things that people are doing that's working right now. Um, but I've always said that in the enterprise, you have to redefine sexy if you want to understand what's going on. Um, cause it's just different, right? Like the fact is that if, you know, like things I've documented, like a, a support team that's able to reduce their incoming first level queries by 30% or what have you, um, because they have a bot that can answer those questions actually effectively. And then churning some of those support reps into people that can focus more, not only on higher level stuff, but on upselling products and stuff like that. Okay, if that's not sexy to you, then you sh- then no offense, but you shouldn't be in enterprise work, <laughs> right? Because that's actually <laughs> sexy, like because that's cost savings. That's also some revenue growth opportunity. It's it's a bit of both. And is it life changing? Like is it revolution? No, but it's helping, right? And it's making a difference in people's lives. Um, and then simultaneously, I, I would agree with colleagues like Brian Summer that get impatient about the lack of big, exciting ideas because there is a lot more big, exciting stuff, I think, but it has to do with what Barb is talking about, which is more not like, oh, you know, we turn this white paper into Shakespearean sonnet. Who gives a shit? No one's going to read your sonnet. You know, it's more about how do we do marketing totally differently than we've done in the past and like, 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 can this, can these tools help us to do that? And in her post, she talked more about that. I'll read just a little bit more. She said, um, marketers also need these capabilities in their own tools and I haven't seen them yet. So she's expressing the same kind of thing of these bigger ideas. Like, why can't we be more imaginative about this? Instead of relying on pre-built reports, why can't marketers ask questions and have AI do the hard work of analyzing and pulling everything together and then enable the marketers to select which insights to act on and help create the framework of a campaign to make that happen. Sure, there's content creation in there, but it's only part of what happens and it's not the first thing. So to me, Brent, like when I think about the fall events, I hope that changes. I hope we see more of what Barb's referring to there and just more of a different kind of conversation. But anyhow, that's just me. No, you know what? I I, I definitely want to see more of that, but I will say, uh, give a shout out to like last week I was at Pega World and... Um, they uh, introduced something they're calling uh, their uh, Socrates. And it's aimed at kind of uh, transforming corporate learning. And it's really interesting because, you know, you, you go back to the days of, <laughs> I guess, Greece, Greece and, and, and Socrates. Yeah, Socrates and the and the holding court, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, yep. you know, traditionally, corporate learning is uh, take a test uh, with mo- a bunch of multiple choice answers. And you, you know, you, you kind of tick the boxes and uh, you get a pass or fail at the end and you pretty much learn how to take a test. You don't really learn how to help a customer, you know, in, a, in the realest sense where so what they're saying is, why don't we take, you know, this, these tools, Gen AI and traditional AI, and let's, let's form tests or way better ways to help people learn. And so instead of just learning how to, you know, do multiple choice answers, you actually get walked through a series of of questions like, you know, the Socratic method that is aimed at helping you li- really learn it something, some skill, some way to do something, but it's done in a in a much more uh, I think more natural way. Mm-hmm. And because these tools, we have these huge data centers, we have all this data, why not take something like corporate learning and, and transform it because the technology is there and use these these tools to do it. I would love to have more stories like that because I think those are the yeah. things that are the most interesting developments when it comes to all this stuff. 
Yeah, right. I mean, it, you know, it, it it's it's kind of like how, you know, in in creative work where like when you learn a musical instrument where the really gifted people start doing stuff that no one's ever done before, you know, and and you start realizing, wait, I can use this tool in a different kind of way than everyone else is using it. And I think that that's what's going to get interesting in the enterprise context. Uh, you know, because I think enterprises have spent a whole lot of time you know, on things like privacy and security and trying to improve accuracy, reduce some of the bullshit hallucination output. And they've made some good strides there. So some of the, some of that conversations in place now, like, like, yes, we can do this safely with your data. Obviously that they'll have to continue to talk about that, but that's there. It's, it's a different animal than just working on chat GPT and, okay, sometimes it's not as fun because you're restricted uh, based on your role or you're restricted based on what you can ask in certain situations. But that's the price of like avoiding some of the, you know, sensational stuff. So, so you get that figured out, but now it's like, what can we do with it? And that's what's really cool about the example you just gave because it works in that context, right? Like you have the roles, you have the security, you have the private, you have all that shit. Now let's set it loose on something cool. Well, what's what's more in need of rejuvenation than learning? Like, how many people are desperate to improve their skills and talents right now in in a meaningful way inside their organizations and don't really have the opportunity to take weeks off to go to some class or some MBA program or whatever? Yeah, I love it. You know, like let's set this loose on learning and see what happens. Like, this is great. You know? Yeah, I, and I and I think we will see. I, I at least I'm hopeful that we will see uh vendors at least in our space really doing that because i think the first step is realizing like just thinking about that learning example uh coming to the 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 conclusion i guess is that the way that we've learned in, in the uh, corporate setting sucks right you you kind of been forced into doing it this way because of certain limitations it might be resources it might be technology might be a, a combination of different things, but some of those uh, restrictions, they're going, they're going away. You've right. got these huge amounts of data. You've got these great AI platforms. You got data centers, you, you, you got electricity. Uh, you have now have the opportunity to, to completely disrupt stuff that has been ingrained and wrong for decades. And it's cool to see companies at least starting to figure this out to say, you know what? We don't have to do this this way. Maybe we had to before, but this is why this stuff is really exciting to me. I, it took me a while to get kind of excited about the Gen AI stuff because of what you said. Everybody was talking about how, you know, creating poems and, you know, drawing horses. I mean, how the hell do you stay uh, excited about that for more than an hour? But seeing what's going on with you know, some of the ways that they're, these companies are using it from a healthcare perspective and from like real things that we all know are jacked up and could have huge impact on our quality of life. Seeing it start to show up in those places. Now, that's exciting. Not the purple cow stuff. This is the stuff that's really exciting, I think. Yeah, for sure. Well, it sounds like you did learn some stuff on the road. That was interesting too. A few minutes ago, when you said you actually learned some stuff this spring, um, what what would you say you learned? Well, I think the main thing I learned is that there are pockets of these stories that are really coming out, and and mm -hmm. you're seeing, you know, like I said, getting beyond that low lowest common denominator of, you know, maybe. You know, it's it's an easy thing, you know, creating content easier. Oh, of course. Yeah, that's a good thing. And it can be a good thing. Uh, but it's just one of those things. And it's not, to me, the most challenging thing. And right. going to these companies, you know, spending some time at Zoholics. And and I, I think I just posted a clip of a conversation we had with uh, Ram over there, who's their director of AI research. And he, it, you know, if anybody's interested in how how I think how I think it was how to optimize privacy while using public LLMs and kind of what goes into that. Check that out because he did a great job of synthesizing that. And I think it's less than two minutes or something like that. Um, so there's, there, there are, it's starting to get out there, you know, and I know you're always on the hunt for that. Uh, and those are the things that are catching my attention. 
And I think we're seeing more and more of those things and, and not just the dog and pony stuff. Look over here. But if you actually look beyond the dog and pony, you are seeing some things. Yeah, I didn't get as much of that this spring, unfortunately, but um, I hope to get more of it because I know it's happening out there. It's just, you know, you you, you kind of go to the shows you go to and you and you find out what you can. And most of what I got into this year and documented extensively as I could was what enterprises are doing to to create more what you might call responsible AI frameworks. Because without that in place, you can't do the cool stuff that you just described with Pega, for example. And so in, uh, in the case of Zoho, even in January, I had a terrific conversation with them around some similar stuff, I think, to what you covered. But they were talking a lot back then about different size language models and the power of that, the power of being able to use smaller models and combine different models against each other and different things. And it, it sounds perhaps dry on some level, but it's super important because it has to do with things like protecting privacy, keeping costs down, controlling how much data ever has to leave enterprise walls to go to any of the, these LLM environments for any reason and stuff like that. And, and, you know, and, and so a lot of conversations this spring centered around things like that, centered around improving accuracy of prompt outputs and protecting privacy, all that stuff. And, and the architectures vendors are, are using for that are all kind of different than each other in some ways. Some of them are more aggressive about knowledge graphs, for example, which are a really interesting way of, of influencing uh, prompt input in, in a way that, gets, that shows the LLM relationships that it might not understand between perhaps different people or different departments or whatever, uh, cause and effect, basically, that LLMs don't really get very well. So, so I spent a lot of time on that, and that's good because you that that allows you to say, okay, this is not just um, like Google Gemini giving you advice to like to put glue on your pizza or whatever. Like this is <laughs> this is a totally different kind of conversation. But like what you're saying, I think is what has to come next, which is more of those conversations around. Okay, we're making some really good progress on on the architecture and the, the pr privacy the ethical architecture, all that shit. Now we're going to do show you some really cool stuff we can do. And it's not just going to be like, oh, you can write a blog post and you can write a job description and you can, you know, and, 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 and there was been a whole lot of talk around co-pilots too. And like, while I think some of the co-pilots are going to be useful to people, like to me, there's a point at which like, can we just stop talking about co-pilots for a little while? Like we're going to have them. I get that. But it's like, oh my God. Like, like, okay, I get it. Like, it's going to help, it's going to help you solve some problems, but it's not to me nearly as exciting as what you're describing, which may have some little bit of a co-pilot flavor, but it's, it's geared towards accessing a learning environment in a different, more intuitive way. That's exciting. Like, that's what I want to see more of. And, and I think part of it is also in the way that these vendors are presenting this stuff and, you know, and talking about it because I think, you know, buzzwords, we've been the scourge of our existence for decades. So if a buzzword catches on, it's going to get used to death. And sometimes it's used to death at the, uh, really at, at, at the fault of you actually have a real story to tell here beyond the buzzword. Yeah. And and I appreciate vendors who are are starting to uh, not talk about Gen AI in the, the most lowest common denominator sense, but right. they're actually saying, hey, here's the challenge. And as we kind of walk through our solution through the challenge, you know, we are using you know certain things, but it's not like okay, we're you you know Gen AI is the first thing out of their their head when they're talking about what they're doing. It's like, all right, this component here it does this. And yeah, Jenai kind of helps us with that part. And then it moves over to this part. You know, I think we're seeing a little, a little bit more sophistication around how this is at least starting to be talked about. And I think uh, that will be good because uh, eventually, you know, somebody, I think, I forget where I heard this, but, you know, one, eventually we're going to get to the point where we're not even talking about AI because it's just going to be so foundational. Right. And it's, you know, you, it's what's the point of saying it all the time if it's always there? So you don't have to say it. We're going to get to that part. And I think 
It's going to be vendors who are able to get there fast enough and, and integrate it into what they have all what always been doing and right. not just say, uh, yeah, we've been around for 20 years, but don't look at what we did for the uh, first 19. We just want to talk about the Gen AI. Uh, and the, it's so disconnected. The, the, the smart right. vendors are already connecting what this stuff is to what they've been doing all along and how that combination makes what right. they've been doing better and more ready for going forward. I don't hear a lot of them talking like that yet. Yeah, it, it in 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 my musical analogy, they're not they're not playing the Star Spangled Banner with Jimi Hendrix using those tools just yet. You know, they're they're still practicing their basic chord progressions. You know, yeah, and and they haven't figured out quite how to make the tools their own. And 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 there's been so much of like wanting to reassure customers that we're on we're on the path. But um, but not speaking about it in a way usually that really resonates is like, oh yeah, you're solving my problem. And you're starting to get there a little bit, like vendors starting to say, like, if you're a finance vendor, like here's what we're we're solving these finance problems with this tool and stuff like that. But you're right. I mean, we just haven't gotten there yet. And and hopefully over the fall, pe- over the summer season, people can reflect on kind of where they might have come up a little bit short with that. And maybe in the fall we'll start to see a little bit more. I got a couple of good customer stories, but again, customers are still in pretty early stages. I don't know about you. Did you get any like customers live on this stuff that were doing anything interesting yet? Or mm, I don't think so. Not yet. I think it is still early. And it may be part of the reason why uh, a lot of these vendors are talking the way they do is maybe they, they feel like the audience isn't ready uh, to really handle some of the things that we're talking about or, or the framing that we're talking about. They're I don't not ready. They're not ready for the star spangled banner yet, <laughs> yeah. but by Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Yeah. They might not be ready for that. Yeah. They have to do the Benny, uh, Benny yeah. Goodman version until, you know, they're ready for the Jimi Hendrix. Version. I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I will say it feels like, uh, you know, since chat GPT came out, what November of 2022 and we're about what, a little over a year and a half, almost closing on two years. I have seen a significant movement. I mean, you have seen, uh, you know, you have seen a lot of developments. You have seen actual stuff. uh, And maybe a year from now, we'll be in a completely different, you know, mind frame with all this stuff and, and actually have some concrete customers actually doing some of the stuff that we've been, at least they've been, you're talking about and and building their platforms to be able to do uh it will be great to actually see people using this stuff were there any other stories that got you really excited from all of that or you had a couple of really good examples uh i'm trying to think um i would say that you know those are the kind of the ones because i mm-hmm. you know what we've been going on so many conferences i think i've been oh well this yeah. year so far and, I, and uh, some of this stuff is really blurred. I have to admit, some of it is blurred. Yeah. Um, I will say, like uh, thinking back to a little bit of around pros and and you know they're kind of like an original AI, not Gen, but they were like right. uh, you know analytical AI and all prescriptive or whatever you want to call yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so it was really interesting to see a company like that who is ingrained, entrenched in AI for like thirty years how this whole new focus of gen ai has uh how how they position around that and and how the gen ai conversation has that you know how that has affected or impacted uh the traditional predictive ai and it has kind of brought a new spotlight you know the gen ai spotlight has spread out and so i think one of the 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 main hopeful takeaways uh from this low combinating lowest combinator denominator is you know it's not just gen ai here gen ai is kind of working as one of the ais along with you know the the no code platforms there there are more components than just gen ai and i think people are starting to realize oh it's not you just don't say it's gen ai every time you see something because it's not there's more to it than just that. And I think, you know, that conference really laid that home 
and I, it feels like at least to a certain extent, maybe it's just the industry that they focus in, which is uh, the, uh, the airlines. Uh, it's, it's not just the gen AI conversation. It is a full blown AI and how, which AI does what and how they work together to pull off the solution. Once again, right. that it's the salute. It's the challenge and the, and the overall solution. It's not just talking about gen AI all the time. Yeah. And now you've reinforced that point I was making earlier, which I think is so important, which is like, these tools can do cool things, but you have to come at them with with a with a unique point of view and a and something you've developed that that matters in this world. And then the tool can help you with that. Like so, like in the case of an individual, like I said, you have life experience, you have some expertise you want to share. You, you know, you 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 understand deeply modern travel, maybe, and you want to figure out how to use the tool to to to, to tap into all the travel documentation, whatever. Like in a corporate setting with the pros example you had, there's a company that has a strong point of view on what they do and they've been working in the related technologies for a long time. And so for them to really, they can plug those tools into something that already exists, a, a good data platform, a, a, a strong point of view. And, and so hopefully vendors can start relaxing into those stories because those stories are interesting. And 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 that's not about like, oh, this new tool is going to revolutionize everything. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. But it's more about how it plugs into what you're already doing that gets exciting, right? So it's not Gen AI per se in the case of pros. It's how Gen AI ties into the stuff they're already doing and and then adds something to it and, and probably makes the information more accessible, for example, which is one of the best things about these tools, I think, is how how they make it easier to get at content and information that was in the past let's face it, hoarded by experts in silos that you couldn't get into. And and you wanted that data and you couldn't get it. And BI's been trying to solve that problem for decades now. And maybe we have some new ideas here. So that's cool. Like, I'm good with that. There's one thing I did want to point out, though. And um, this is something that I spent a lot of time looking at. And, and it, it's kind of a, a bothersome aspect is that there there's kind of two ways forward here. And one is what we describe, which is, Vendors and companies bearing down on these use cases, using these tools responsibly, but starting to think more creatively about how to use them. So that that's a good direction. But then there's other direction, which is, oh my God, the pace of advancement is unreal. In a year, like everything's going to be just fucking incredible, and we'll have AGI in like three years. And and I'm here to tell you that that is unlikely. Like it's not impossible. But there's a lot of sloppiness in our industry around accepting as fact that just because there's been a lot of progress means there will continue to be. And I've got news for you. That's not what's happening. Like tools like OpenAI and Gemini, et cetera, they have, there's not much more data they can train on. There's not much more scale that they can add. This is how these tools progress to this point the last few years. And key founders in this technology that I study in the deep learning field, like Yashua Bengio and Yan Lacoon, are looking for new ways forward because they've realized that 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 scale is not just going to lead us to intelligence. Like these systems are not as intelligent as you think. Like the last time I described this, I talked about the machine learning tool that I use, and you can search Dynamica if you want to know which one I use for my transcripts. I'm not going to bash them because because they're not unique in this area, but. The, the the word Holocaust wound up in one of my transcripts and in and, and into one of my articles. Um and 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 any tool that understands language would never have allowed that to happen or it would have flagged that. Now you can, like some of these these uh consumer AIs, you can build in guardrails to catch certain things like that, but that's not the same as truly understanding it. It's just you know, and, and and the amazing thing about it, of course, is that the bulk of the transcripts are really quite good. Like, and and it even has like a summary and action items and stuff. And so, for a second, you think it really understands me, and then you see the word Holocaust in the middle of a sentence, and you realize it has no idea what's really going on with language. So, just to build on that, McDonald's pulling its uh, artificial intelligence drive-through tests um, now. Um, some vendors are having a little more luck than McDonald's. So this is a very complicated story, but this is an interesting issue because it's like, I call it the AI overreach, but what can go wrong, right? Like, well, you know, human, uh, drive-through people can make mistakes too. 
Yeah, that's true. But do human drive through people take orders for 400 McNuggets? <laughs> do do human drive through do human drive through people recommend bacon with your with your ice cream? No, I don't think that they do. And so, but but I read one of these articles, and this one's from a publication I'm not very impressed with called Artificial Intelligence News. So you guys, I'm not impressed with you. Just who cares? They probably couldn't give a shit about me either. Um, but they go on to say here, um, they make some good points. But but they go on to say, like, basically, if I can find it, it's it's basically like, who knows, within a year, this could all get solved. And again, that's where I would just throw up cautions for people and to say, look, there will continue to be improvements, but there's some limitations to this technology that have caused some of the people that founded it to go back to the lab and try some new approaches to try to get closer to actual intelligent systems. Because the problem is that when you have accuracy issues, you have human supervision, which impacts ROI. So that's why people are fussing over this. Does it mean that you can't use this stuff? No, but it's all about intelligently designing these tools. And then, and then companies hopefully don't make the mistake of wanting to fire a bunch of you know, drive through orderers when the tool isn't you know, ready because it's going to ring up 500 friggin' McNuggets or whatever. And it's like, <laughs> No, that's not going to get solved in a year. You know why? Because, because these tools don't understand language. And in, in a year's time, they're not going to understand language. Well, the, could they get a little better? Yeah. Could they, cross, cr- could they figure out how to cross-check it against your preferences and identify you as you're driving in so that like, they, they map that against your orders in the past? Yes, there's things they can do. But what I would encourage people to do is just realize that what the technology you have now will get better. But don't sit there expecting that in a year, it's going to be some dramatic improvement. Just work with what you got and try to make more out of that because that's the discussions that you're showing me, which is like the thing about the Pega example, they don't need Gen AI to get any better to do what they're trying to do with the training thing. They can get on with it. And if if the Gen AI tools get even superior at certain things, that's going to be even better for them. But the point is get on with it, but don't give me any more lazy stuff around how, oh, we're on this thing. I mean, there's even been articles written about OpenAI acknowledging that that GPT-5, it's not there yet. Like there's not, there's not something coming that's going to revolutionize the next thing. Now, some people, what they're doing is they're talking about agents and they think agents are going to, but the problem with agents is that you can only stitch together stuff that actually works. So it's like, well, um, you know, would you tell an AI right now to go plan your trip to Greece, you know, for your family? And, and, you know, and get back with me when you've booked everything. No, you would not. <laughs> no, you would not. We're still stuck on like, make me a dinner reservation at the best Mexican restaurant in town. That's enough of a challenge, right? I'm um, still stuck so, with this thing. Right. What is that? That's the uh, rabbit AI device that, that is pretty much useless, at least for my, I thought I'd take a shot, $200 device, AI device. You know, along it's kind of along the lines of that, uh, the humane AI pen. Yeah, 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 yeah. These devices are not ready. Maybe with Apple coming on board, maybe the phone will be that device. I don't know. It's, it's, you know, it, it's such early days. And I, I, there's so many things that you can point to as it's not ready. But a year from now, who knows? Because things seem to be moving really fast with all this stuff. And maybe we'll be uh, pleasantly surprised. Yeah, we could we could make a lot of progress in a year. But I, I'm just saying that if you study the technology, you realize that these are not cognitive systems, and that's going to take some work. Right. But ha- having said that, like like you could I could be wrong too, and they, there could be an amazing breakthrough. But generally, a lot of these breakthroughs have not come like from the like like OpenAI, for example. OpenAI's got a lot of shareholder stuff they're sweating right now. I I would if I'm thinking about the next AI breakthrough, I'm thinking about a couple of mad scientists in a lab somewhere, uh, you know, without any time pressures, really, just trying to testing shit and testing robots and trying different things. And I'm not thinking about OpenAI trying to deliver for their shareholders with Satya Nadella come knocking every week. Hey, how, <laughs> how's the progress going on that? And then Tim Cook is knocking over here. You know, how are you doing on that? I those things create their own set of pressures around that stuff. Um, but but the good news is that that you don't need these tools to be perfect. I mean, yes, it does take some use cases off the table, right? Because you wouldn't want AI running like a nine one one center or something like that. But 
but but could you experiment with low level support query chatbot? Sure. Yeah. Could you experiment with like low level sales? Sure. Um, so it's all about like, you know, looking at accuracy versus use case and realizing, hey, this stuff is plenty accurate enough for a lot of stuff. I mean, heck, half the stuff that we do in the enterprise is based on predictive shit that we get wrong anyway, right? So um, hey, if we're you know, 70% on our predictions and we can get 80 with NAI. Let's do that. But tell me a little more about your device. What have you tried to do with this device? You, you say it looks like a paperweight. Does it actually do something? Let's see. I don't even know if I have it. Yeah. It, 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 it uh, let's see. Can you see? Yeah. You can actually kind of see it. Um, so it allows you to like talk to it and it, and it has a camera. So, oh, I need to update the software. Okay. Maybe I have to do that. Uh, you can, you can uh, integrate. Services like Spotify, so you can play music, Uber, uh, you can order rides and Uber food. Uh, but it's just like this little device. You could uh, carry it around with you. You see something out when you're in, in the public. You could uh, hold it up to it and say, tell me more about what this is. And it's, it, you know, gives you like a, a pretty detailed summary if it knows if it knows what it is. A lot of times it doesn't know what it is and it's just gibberish. It, it's so not ready for prime time. But I said, I'll. Oh, it's only 200 bucks. I'll buy it and see how it works. And we'll see. Hey, dude, I got to go. because No, no worries. Go. No worries. But can I just ask you, have you found anything that it does good? Like, I mean, not Spotify, but something interesting AI like. Is there anything you've been able to do with it? Like, for example, order up a ride. Can you do that? Or I, I haven't tried it myself. Okay. I've I've just done the music thing. And yeah, that's, that's like dog and pony stuff. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So you got to go real quick before you go. Just a quick plug. Uh are you guys going to still have plenty of shows on PP players production network over the summer? Or do you scale back a little bit? What, what can viewers expect? Uh, there might be a few shows that are take a hiatus. I think, uh, uh, whispered insights with, uh, the one and only Esteban Kolsky is taking a summer hiatus. Uh, but for the most part, I think we'll be around still doing the thing. Cool. All right. Well, uh, you, you guys should check LinkedIn for uh, follow Brent, follow Paul Greenberg and track because they got a full slate of shows for you to keep these conversations going all summer long. Thanks, Brent. Larry, really enjoyed that conversation. Catch awesome, you man. We'll see, see you at Labor Day. You got it. After Labor Day. See ya. Ladies and gentlemen, that was Brent Leary. He's now signing off to go do whatever Brent Leary does on Friday. And I'm going to do the same. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, I knew we had some viewers hanging into that. Uh, it was a little seat of the pants, but actually I thought Brent had some really good stuff from his uh, his spring travels there. So that was actually like really a uh, really worthwhile discussion. Um, anywho, uh, I don't think I have any more slides to show you this time, but there will be more when I get uh, the Enterprise Month in Review rolling again uh, with Brian next month working on our topics now. Uh, meantime, hope you have a great weekend. Hope you enjoyed the discussion and, uh, feel free to pop me ideas for future shows and we'll do them whenever we can. All right. Have a great weekend, y'all.